The, um, you know, I felt like this. I was talking to a, a gentleman earlier before service, and, and uh, he asked me a question, and it just kind of hit me, and I really feel like it's a prophetic thought. It's a God-inspired thought. I really feel like there's going to come a moment in the near future that there's going to be a tipping point for this church. Because as I look around and I feel, the, feel this place, and I been, remember coming here before this place looked like this, and I'm really impressed at what things look like. And I think there has been proper preparation for what's coming and what's going to happen. Too many people wait till something happens to try to get ready. If you wait till something happens to get ready, you'll miss it when it shows up. And so I was thinking about this, and I really believe that this is a God thought, that, that there's going to come this tipping point. And as I was thinking about a tipping point, you know, when you start lifting something that's heavy, it's, it's not necessarily easy. You know, you start pulling up some weight, and it's like, ah, ah, you know, and you have to try to get down under it, and you start trying to, and then there comes this point where you're putting your shoulder into it, and what was seemed to be working against you all of a sudden starts working for you. The thing that you're, it starts pulling you. And I believe that day is coming, and that day's going to come bef- sooner than you think. And sometimes when you're like this, you kind of wonder if it's ever going to happen, but you wait when that tipping point starts. You'll feel it. You'll feel it. Because it feels great, I'm telling you, and you're about to experience it. Believe that with all my heart. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn them on, light them up, open them up, ever how you do it. First Timothy chapter 4 is where I want you to go. I want to share a few different things with you. As you're turning there, it's an honor for me to be on the board of this church. I, I, I'm, I'm committed to the vision, to the plan, to the purpose of this church. Um, as you're turning 1 Timothy 4, say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, Jesus, speak to my heart, heart. change my life, life. in Jesus' name. name. Father, I pray over the remainder of our time together, I pray, God, the heavens would stay open over us, Lord. I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would minister to us, God, that you would speak directly, powerfully to every single person in this room. God, that your word would get into our heart. Help us to open up our hearts and help us to grab a hold of the thing that you're saying to us and wanting to put in us. Help us to engage our minds so that our thinking can be renewed and our thinking can be lifted to a higher level so that we can think and live the way you want us to live. Father, I pray that you would anoint me. Allow me the privilege to stand in your heart and be your mouthpiece. Anoint my mouth, my tongue, my lips. Make me an oracle. Allow me the privilege to communicate your thoughts in Jesus' mighty name. If you agree with that, somebody shout amen. Amen. So I'm an audience participation kind of preacher, so it's very appropriate, and I expect it, for you to say something to me. My wife invited uh, a nurse from the doctor's office that she goes and visits sometimes to come, and uh, that she goes to sometimes, and invited this nurse to come to our church. And So this nurse showed up, and she's sitting next to somebody at our church, and, and I'm preaching, and they screamed out, shut up, and... Uh, then somebody else screams, preach, white boy. And she's like, this is the rudest church I've ever been in. And, uh, and then she realized after a few moments that it was actually, they were, they were stoked on what was happening. So I expect you to say something. Because if you don't say anything, I'll think you're not getting what I'm talking about. And I'll just preach that much longer on that point, trying to help you understand what I'm saying. So if you just want to get it over with quick, say, we're picking up what you're laying down, go to the next point. I want to talk to you from the thought, multiply, multiply, what to do with what God gives you. What to do with what God gives you. When I say that, probably some of you immediately think about money or finances or things like that. But I do want to talk to you about stewardship. But stewardship has to do with so much more than just money. I believe God cares about every detail. I believe God cares about everything to do with your life. I believe everything that goes on with you and then goes on in you and what God wants to do through you, God cares about all of those details. I believe life is a gift. I don't believe it's random. I don't believe it's happen happen chance. I believe it's a gift. God's given you a gift. God's given you an opportunity. 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you're there, say, I got it. Verses 12 through 16 says this, says, let no one despise your youth. Touch the person next to you and say, don't look down on me anymore. 
Did you say that with confidence? Do you feel like a young, young person when you said that? Don't let anybody, don't let, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love, in spirit and faith and purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. Somebody say, I got a gift in me. He said, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress, your progress may be evident to all. So people can see and experience your, your multiplying. Where you come into this thing isn't where you stay. That your progress may be evident to everybody else that's around you. He said, take heed, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. The Apostle Paul is saying, I want you to do something with the gift that God has given you. I want you to do something with this gift called life. I want you to do something with what God has placed on the inside of you. I was thinking about this thought as it relates to what we're talking about right here. Most people, most people have a habit of preparing for their day. I probably could ask you what time you're going to get up tomorrow. And you probably could tell me exactly what time you'll get up tomorrow. And you can tell me exactly what your routine will look like as you prepare for the day. Preparing for the day. You probably could tell me Monday, Tuesday, any other day of the week, you probably could tell me exactly how much time it takes you to prepare for the day. Whether it's taking a shower or drinking coffee, whatever you do, you're preparing for the day. And as I was thinking about most people, most people prepare for the day. We, most of you in this room prepared to come into this room and the ones of you that didn't, we can tell you didn't and... Or rather, we can smell you didn't, but we got grace for you. That's cool. You're in the right place. <laughs> but I thought about this. I thought about if we would just, if we would begin to take part of our day in preparing for the gifting that's on the inside of us to be manifested through us in the day, how much different would our day be if we focus on the kingdom that's on the inside of us? For those of us that have given our life to Christ, the kingdom of God's on the inside of us. The grace of God is on the inside of us. The gifting of God is on the inside of us. And I thought, what would our life be like if we were to take some time and focus on that gift that's on the inside of us? One of my friends uh, texted me the other day and he said, I'm sitting before God and I'm preparing to go and preach. And as I thought about what he was saying, it kind of it kind of dawned on me that really what he was saying was that I'm I'm focusing on the gift that's on the inside of me, and I'm preparing myself for that gift to work in me, so that as I stand in the lane that God's called me to, it'll have the impact in the lane that God has assigned me to. I thought, what would happen if we were to focus on that gift every day? You know, God's given talents to people. Sometimes people think, well, I don't have a gift or I don't have a talent. I'm not called to be a preacher. I'm not called to stand on a platform. I'm not called to be a singer, a worship team member, or something like that. But the reality is God has gifted every single person in this room. You're probably familiar with the story of the talents. He said to one he gave five, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. He gave, he gave talents unto men. He gave talents to everybody. In the context of that, he's talking about money. A talent was, was, uh, was, was money. But, but it's an applicable principle that you could apply to your gifting, to your talent. That's on the inside. Everybody is talented at something. Everybody's got a gift to do something. And I think, I think it's a shame that somebody would live their entire life trying to be good at something that they've not been gifted to be good at. You know, I have three kids. My, my boys, academically, they're, they're, they're brilliant. They're, they're actually smarter than me, and I'll say that because I'm on the other side of the United States, and, but I don't want them to hear me say that. 
Because I'll never forget when one of my sons was 16, he looked me in the eye and said, I'm smarter than you. And I looked at him and I, I could tell he meant every word of it. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm like, well, I, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but um, it's going to be all downhill from here on out. Because one day you're going to be like me. <laughs> and, uh, but they are smart. They are smart. My, my kids, like math. Math is super easy for my boys. My daughter, my daughter, I mean, she hates math. Math makes her cry. Her math made me cry. You know, when I was in school, algebra was an elective. Like in middle school, but in middle school now, it's like, it's mandatory. So I don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to have a prophetic unction come over me to know that my daughter is never going to be a tax attorney. She's not gifted to do that. She's not hardwired for that. God's hardwired everybody. And and how he has hardwired you is directly connected to the gifting that he has placed on the inside of you. There's a lane that God wants you to operate in in life. For some, it's in education. For others, it's in government. For some, it's in the church. Others, it's called to be homemakers. They're, they're, God, is, God has gifted people for every sphere of life. And you have to know what you're called to. You have to know what makes you thrive, what wakes you up. If the Bible says He gave gifts unto men. Somebody say, I got a gift. He, he's given you a gift that's on the inside of you. He said he gave to them. He gave to one five. He gave to another two. He gave to another one. The Bible says he gave according to their ability. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give you more than what you're capable of doing? Sometimes people think, well, I can't handle this. I, 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 I can't do this. Or, or they'll look at somebody else and say, I don't know how you handle that. Well, the reason they can handle what other people can't handle is because he has given them Gifts according to their ability. God doesn't give you more than what you can handle. When God gives you something, He gives you what you're capable of handling. I think one of the challenges is sometimes we try to compare ourselves among ourselves to determine how gifted we are. Well, I can't be like them, so therefore I guess I'm not as gifted or I'm not gifted at all. And when we begin to compare ourselves to each other. We actually become fools as a result of comparing ourselves one to another because the reality is we don't all start in the same place and we're not all called to the same lane. Just because you're gifted at just because somebody is gifted at one thing and you're not gifted at, at the same thing that they're gifted at, it doesn't mean that you're not gifted. He gave gifts. You got a gift on the inside of you. And Paul was telling Timothy, do something with the gift that's on the inside of you. Some of you have no idea what's on the inside of you. Some of you, if you would begin to mine out what God has placed on the inside of you, it would blow you away. God sees things in you that you can't even see within yourself. You know, I didn't grow up in the church world. I wish I did grow up in the church world. I, I think the greatest testimony is somebody who has served God all their life. That doesn't mean serving God all your life means you've been perfect all your life. But I think that's the greatest testimony somebody could ever have. Sometimes we think if somebody carried a gun and shot at people, went to prison and strung out on dope for 12 years, man, they got an amazing story. Come on, I think it's harder to stay saved and serve God. Come on. You know what I mean? Anybody can get high and rob a bank and go to prison. (laughs) And, and so we have these giftings on the inside of us, and God wants to bring them out of us. You know, a lot of people looked at me, and they, they, they because I, I, I did struggle with addiction for 12 years. I struggled with cocaine addiction for 12 years. And a lot of people, after felt, you know, just one failed attempt after another to get my life together and to change my life, you know, people, people kind of gave up on me and said, well, that's just the way he's going to be. And maybe there are people in your world that you've given up on and you've just decided that that's just who they are and that's just the way they're going to be. God can see things not only in them that maybe you can't see, but God can see things in you that that you can't see. I would have never imagined that one day I would be a preacher. I was the last person that anybody would have ever thought 
would have been a preacher. If you would have gone up to my, my old crew and asked them, which one among you will become a preacher one day? They would have never pointed me out and said, that dude right there. You know, God didn't put the calling or the gifting on the inside of me to be a preacher after I gave my life to Him. I came into this world with that gifting on the inside of me. He told, he told Jeremiah, he says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb and I called you. Where did he call him? He called him in his mother's womb. Before the mother's womb. There's people with giftings on the inside of them. It's in raw form. It's in seed form. It's on the inside of you. Some of you could amaze yourself if you were to just begin to focus on the gifting that's on the inside of you. Spend time getting ready for the day, preparing for the day. What if you were to really start preparing to dig down deep and pull that gifting out that's on the inside of you? How much different that your day could be. You know, when he gave these talents to people, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't guarantee them the outcome, even though he had preordained the outcome. God has charted your life. God has charted a good course for your life. The plans he has for you are good and not evil, says the Lord. God's got an incredible plan for your life, but just because he's got an incredible plan for your life doesn't mean that everything he's got planned for your life will happen in your life. It requires... Pr- Participation. Because, you know, when he gave gifts, he gave these gifts to men, these talents to men. The Bible says that, that the one who gave the talents away, he gave them to men. He went away. He didn't stay right there. Of course, we know that Jesus never leaves us nor forsakes us. But he gives us something and then he steps back to see what we're going to do with what he gives us. He gave these talents to people, but you know what he really gave them? He gave them an opportunity. You know what God gave you today? He gave you an opportunity. You know what God gives you when He gives you this gift called life? Is He gives you an opportunity. He gives you this gift. He gives you life. He puts things on the inside of you. And He steps back and He says, now what are you going to do with it? What if we were to focus on what's on the inside of us and begin to pull it out of us and begin to operate in it throughout our day? How much different would our day be? Because every day is an opportunity. You have to understand what's on the inside of you isn't just for you. It's for somebody else because the lane that God has called you to operate in, He wants you to operate in that lane because He loves people that are in the path of that lane. You have to also begin to, you got to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. I think it's great that you can come to church and be encouraged. I've never understood why anybody would go to a church that they're more depressed when they leave than when they came and... You drive past the medical marijuana clinic, and there they are going in. It's like, what are you doing? Well, I just, I just left church. I'm trying to get high and lifted up because I'm depressed. And, you know, I don't know if they have medical marijuana clinics here. I'm from California. We got those everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Just wait. It'll show up. And, the, uh, and so, uh, you know, I think it's great that we, we encourage people people and we should be encouraged and church should be a place to be encouraged and I know your pastor is always encouraging me every time I talk to him he says something encouraging but there are going to be moments in life where you've got to learn to encourage yourself it's one thing for somebody to try to invest in you and to encourage you so that you can become everything God has designed for you to become But if you don't ever encourage yourself, you're not going to get very far. Somebody asked me one time, they said, what is your greatest frustration? And I didn't even really have to think about it. I mean, it just came out of me just like that. I said, my greatest frustration is wanting people's future for them more than they want it for themselves. I've seen people at times that have such incredible gifting. It's so obvious to me, but they're not doing anything with that gifting. I'm like, man, if I could just reach in you and take it out and put it in me. I'd make you jealous for what I have, (laughs) you know. There's giftings that are on the inside of us, and God says that we're to do something with it because it's an opportunity. 
Like I said, he doesn't put more on us than what we can handle because he gave to one five, gave to another two, but he expects us to do something with it. And when you really start to try to do something with your life, it's not always necessarily going to be easy. I mean, there's moments in life where life is just clicking and flowing and everything. I mean, it's like the doors are opening and everything's falling into its place. There are those moments. I mean, your entire life shouldn't be hell. Your entire life shouldn't be spiritual warfare. If, you're, if your whole life is spiritual warfare, we need to pray for you. I mean, there are some moments when he leads us beside still waters. You know? I mean, that speaks of peace and joy. Let's have a picnic, somebody. You know? But you've got to learn to encourage yourself because there are those moments when spiritual warfare or real battle shows up. And sometimes the greatest battles that you will face in life aren't necessarily from, from devils or demons or things like that, even though we, I believe in those things. Sometimes the greatest battles you'll face in life is you pushing through the limitations that you feel like you're experiencing from within yourself. He gave them something. They had to do something with it. David encouraged himself. The Bible said he encouraged himself in the Lord. You ever heard that before? It said he encouraged himself in the Lord. Have you ever really studied what he just went through when he encouraged himself in the Lord? Him and his guys had been out at battle. They'd been victorious. They'd come back from fighting. And when they came back from fighting, they came back to the camp. And, and the Malachites had come in and stolen their wives and kids and taken them off and made them slaves. And when they came back to the camp, all of David's men, the men that he had just been out at battle with, talked about stoning him because they couldn't understand why they would experience that, why God would allow that to happen after they had just been out and been victorious. And the Bible says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. There wasn't anybody else to encourage him. I mean, there were everybody else that was around him was talking about stoning him. He encouraged himself. Probably most of us will never experience the type of persecution and warfare that he experienced in that moment. Probably you're not going to go home and, you know, somebody has come in and taken your kids captive. And made your wife a slave. And burnt your house down. And your neighbors aren't going to come out in the street screaming, let's stone them. But there are moments in life where you're going to face things. There are moments in life where you go through things. It rains on the just and the unjust. There's moments when things are going to happen and you're not going to understand why is it happening. You've got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. You've got to learn in that moment to dig down deep on, uh, and grab a hold of what's on the inside of you and mind that out and stay focused on that thing because the enemy's trying to get you to get discouraged and give up and quit and stop and turn around and go back and I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to serve God anymore. I'm just going to give up on this. The enemy will try to attack you and it's in that moment you've got to learn to fight for what's most important. There are those moments you got to learn to fight. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 says this. Paul said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you waged the good warfare. What he was saying was that you've got to learn to fight the warfare with the prophecies of your future. Fight with those things. Fight for those things. You've got to learn to fight for your marriage. Fight for your career. Fight for the thing that God has called you to. I went to a service in the early days of my Christianity. And when I went, I was going through one of the most, one of the most difficult seasons I'd ever gone through in my life. I hurt. My, my soul hurt. My, I mean, life was painful. I was going through seven months. It was like seven months of the worst hell I'd I would, I'd ever experienced. I was clinging to God with everything that was within me. And I went to this service and somebody spoke over my life and it was so right to where I was in that moment. They gave me a cassette tape. Remember cassette tapes? <laughs> if you don't know what a cassette tape is, go to the museum, you'll see one. <laughs> I, they gave me the cassette tape of what happened in that moment and I, every day, every single day, I would put that cassette tape in, in, in my car and I would drive around and I would listen to it over and over and over again, encouraging myself in the Lord, encouraging myself in the middle of my battle. 
You've got to learn to grab a hold of something that will encourage you. Something that comes from God that will encourage you when you're going through the battle. You've got to learn to fight for the most important things in life. The Apostle Paul said in Romans, Romans 1 verse 11, he said, For I long to see, to you, see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift that you may be established. The, the word established in the original language right there actually is a word that the definition of it means the ability to stand in the warfare or when a storm comes. The ability to say, I long to come to you that I can impart to you, that I can strengthen you with what you need to be able to stand when you're going through what you're going through. You know, the enemy will often try to discourage you from coming to church. Well, I don't need to go today, or maybe it's too tough, or facing this, or facing that. I'm not going to go. Whatever. There's, there's a million reasons why not to come. And I don't believe people that miss a Sunday or week here, week there, are people that are going to hell. When, when I first got saved, if, if you weren't at church on Sunday... The deacons were at your house before dinner time. Where were you today? <laughs> now he's disguised it. Are you okay? Don't tell him you went hiking or something. <laughs> but Paul said, I long to impart to you this gift that will encourage you, it will strengthen you. You know, when you come to church, church isn't like any other establishment or institution on the planet. This is a spiritual organization. This is the body of Christ. This is the church of the living God. When you come to this place, there's something happening more than just engaging the intellect. When you come to this place, your mind is being engaged as a result of what's happening in this place. But not, your mind isn't the only thing that's being engaged. There's an impartation that's occurring in the atmosphere of this room right now. Your spirit is catching things that your mind hadn't even picked up yet. Have you ever read something in the Bible and didn't, and, and didn't quite get what you were reading? But then later on, all of a sudden, it was like the light came on. It's like, wow, I get it now. Your spirit got it, but it took a while for your mind to catch up with what your spirit was perceiving in the moment that you read it. Paul said, I long to impart something to you. There's an impartation that is happening in this room right now that is strengthening you so that you can operate in your divine assignment or operate in the gifting that God has placed on the inside of you. Aren't you glad that those days are over where people uh, kind of make people feel like to really serve God, you have to express yourself inside the walls of a building and anything outside the walls of a building is insignificant and really not of kingdom value? Aren't you glad those days are over? Aren't you glad that you can come to a house of God and receive an impartation and be empowered to live a divine assignment outside the walls of the building and it's just as significant, it's just as important as what happens in here? Because I believe that the church house is a spiritual headquarters for the kingdom of God in the earth. And it's the place where we gather together and worship is what we give to God. Preaching is what God gives to us. And He empowers us to go out there and manifest our divine assignment. To, to make a difference in this world. In Ephesians 3, 1 and 2, Paul said, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the Gentiles, he says, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. He said, he said this grace gift that I've received, it's not just for me. He said, it's been given to me, but it's been given to me for you. Touch the person next to you and say, it's for you. He's saying this thing that's on the inside of me, this ability that's on the inside of me, this talent that's on the inside of me, it's not just for me, it's for somebody else. It's for the people that live in the lane that I've been gifted to operate in and live in. This gift that's on the inside of me, that if I will focus on it every day, will be manifested in me and through me, and other people in the lane that I'm operating in will experience this grace, grace gift. And this grace gift will change their life as I'm living this out. Are you getting anything out of this? That's what Paul was saying. He was telling Timothy, what are you going to do with this gift, this opportunity that you have? 
called life. Prepare yourself every day. In verse 16 of 1 Timothy 4, he says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. What he's actually saying is that you are to go out with this grace gift you have into a graceless world and let it be manifested through you and it will change people that are around you. I said I wish I would grown up in church. And I really wish I had grown up in church. But I thank God that somebody who was in church got outside the walls of the church and influenced me with the grace gift that he had on him. I don't know if you really know my story, but a man by the name of Charles Gilchrist is the gentleman who led me to Jesus. He's an entrepreneur. He's a businessman. He's a government leader. He's a mayor of a town. God put this man in my path, and the Lord told him, he said, tell him how I changed your life. We were walking through a warehouse where he had a lot of, uh, a lot of his supplies and, and, and stuff that his business sold. He was in this warehouse. We're walking through this warehouse, and the Lord said, tell him how I changed your life. Here we are in this man's place of business, and he begins to tell me about Jesus Christ. And, and, and I'd been out the night before doing cocaine and drinking, and I was hungover, and I didn't feel good. It was early in the morning. I was just there to do a business deal, wanted to get it over with. The last thing I wanted to hear was some man tell me about Jesus Christ. I was like, that's great. I'm just happy for you. <laughs> I don't feel very good today. And uh, I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. And, and so I, I left that place. I left that place. He, he, took, he took something that his business sold and said, here, I just want to give this to you. He gave it to me as a gift. And I left. And, and God continued to take that man's story and bring it back to my mind over and over again. It's amazing how you can have a conversation. You can just sprinkle a little salt on something. How many of you like a little salt on your... You, you know, you, nobody goes to the restaurant for the salt. But the salt sure does bring out the flavor, doesn't it? I didn't go there to hear what he had to say, but when he put a little salt on the experience, it brought something out that I didn't realize was on the inside. Because when I left that experience, all I could think about, all I could think about was how God had changed this man's life. I would be out partying all night long, and I would be going home jonesing, wanting to continue to get high, but knowing I didn't need to keep on getting high, I needed to, you know, go home and go to sleep. And all I could think about was how God changed this man's life. It was like a seed planted on the inside of me. It was a man outside the walls of a building operating in his grace gift. And I had an experience with him that was trying to bring something out on the inside of me. Trying to, trying to bring it to life. Trying to wake it up on the inside of me. And it was, a, it was a conversation. It was a little sprinkling of salt on my life. He wasn't overbearing. wasn't judgmental. He wasn't finger pointing. He just put a little bit of salt on my life when I came across his path. And as a result of that, it was trying to bring something out on the inside of me. What if we were to begin to live our life in in our lane. And when we have those divine moments in the Holy Spirit said, spring a little salt. Somebody walks away from that experience and it awakens and tries to bring something to life. And as a result of that encounter, it led me ultimately to give my life to Jesus Christ and discover what was on the inside of me the whole time. A preacher was hiding on the inside of me. When I was high, when I was getting high, when I was partying, when I was just, there was something hiding on the inside of me that God said, it's time to come up and out of you. There's things on the inside of you God wants to bring out. It doesn't matter. You've given your life to the Lord. You're saved. You're serving God. But there are things on the inside of you. Because the one with two turned it into four. The one with five turned it into ten. They both doubled what they had. They didn't start at the same place. One started with two. One started at five. We don't all start at the same place. Quit comparing yourselves with other people. Because everybody doesn't start at the same place. But we can all achieve the same results. We can take what we've been given. We can do something with it. And we can double it. We can multiply what God's given us.